Well, we're, we're just saying hi. We're waiting for everyone to uh, and to come. But I've just got back from London, just this moment. Oh, okay. I've just flown in or driven in. <laughs> you didn't go for the wedding. <laughs> I don't, no, I didn't. I wasn't invited, Alan. Was, oh, no. I was quite appalled. Yeah. Ah, there you are. I'm a shadowy figure. You're a you? shadowy figure, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you get in. Come on, dog is here. There we go. Yeah. Hi. Any any comments about um just being in your body? Uh sensing your body, working with your body. Um Yes. Um I, I last I found last week very useful. It was it was um it reminded me of. Sorry, I've gone. Where am I? No, you're still here. I can't see you though. Oh, okay, well I'm still here. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not real, Alan. Yeah. I'm seeing you, but you're not real. <laughs> no. Carry on without me. Sorry, I, I don't know what happened to you. I, I'm just going to poke a door open a little bit because I think the dog's getting upset that the cat's behind the door. Just give me a sec. More tea. Okay. Um, you, you were saying, Francis. Um, no, last, last week some... Session was very. It's always, isn't it? It's always about remembering and remembering to do work, and in the midst of very busy life, yeah. remembering to do the work all the time. And um, no, I found last week very useful, and it was. Um, what should I say? Well, there's several things. Several. Can you see? I can't see it. Yeah, yeah, we can see you fine. At least I can. That's. Um, you might have it set on speaker view, so then whoever is talking will show up. Um, no, there's a no, I don't know what's happening. All I've got is a, is a sort of white page that says launching. Yeah, I was, I'm going to go away. I'll, I'll relaunch. I'll, sorry, forgive me. I'll be okay, back. Okay, in... sure, sure. I man, I got difficult to to connect. Difficulties with the connection. Oh, okay. Connection. There I am. Hello. Yeah, there you are. Yes. Um, so I found last week's very useful. And I, th I think once, for me anyway, I, and whether other people have this experience, if you, if you diligently work and you diligently do what you can do without getting anxious about results or getting concerned about doing the right thing. I mean, I think doing is very important. Um, that's why I explain this. To actually do, do things, whether you having any results, whether you believe you're doing it right or whatever, just to do is absolutely essential. Rather than trying to understand or trying to know, it, it's... Hey, Reggie. Um, Pardon? Ben, I'm just waving a pen. Oh, hello. <laughs> Ben. And, and, and as it's a very good, it was a really good, very good reminder for me. Um, and doing, I'm doing the exercises. I found it, it does change one's state. You know, you, you, you have a sense. I do anyway. One gets a sense. And it's not one that you can explain or not one that you, you can choose to talk about. But it's a... How I put it? One, one is one experiences a difference in the relationship one has with the world, through just through very simple routines, like the ones that we did yesterday, done digitally, done done diligently, done regularly. Um, but they, they do make a very big difference. I think one of the difficulties that I I always come across in me, and I don't know whether it's a Western thing, is trying to understand things. Trying to understand, trying to know um, before doing, okay. if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, and worrying, am I doing this right? Am I, and 
actually, if you do, as I said before, I'm repeating myself, but if you do, then that's when any understanding comes, if you see what I mean. It's about doing stuff rather than understanding it or thinking it, because it can become very imaginary for yeah. me otherwise. And I can imagine I'm working and I'm not. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I've just been reading through uh, uh, Catherine Holmes. Yeah. Um, the notes that are at the uh, uh, Yale Library. And she says, she talks about that exact thing. Um, she oh, says wow. a lot of people think they are observing themselves. You know, I, you know, and it's a thought, you know, the thought, you know, think of leg, think of arm. And she says it's something different. Self-observation yeah. is not a thought. It's not a feeling. It's not a sensation, but it is the observing of the thought, the observing of the feeling, the observing of the sensation. And she calls it a different, um, I don't think she uses the word function, but it's, it's a different quality. Fortunately, yeah. in, in today's world, because of the spread of awareness of mindfulness, I think people, uh, it's much easier to pick up today than it was 100 years ago to understand quite, what we're talking quite about. Probably, yes, quite probably it is, yes. Yeah. It's difficult to describe. It is a, it's just... It's different. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it's not even the feeling, but the sense is different. I, I, I don't know how one describes it. Right. Were, were you able to increase your self-observation this week? Yes. Uh, do you do normally have problems with it? Or is it just that you have the, the hardest part is having the presence of mind to remember no. to do it? Um, as long as you go, ah, remember myself, then it, uh, yeah. you do it. I do. I, I mean, I, I have that there all, but it, it slips in and out. It's very easy for me to go to sleep, okay. you know, just to drift off. Um, I'm, I'm very prone to that uh, and catch myself. And then you know, like I've just driven back from London, which is a two and a half hour drive. And I get in the car, I'm, I'm going to sense, I'm going to self-remember for as much of this as I can. Next thing I know, oh, I'm coming to remembering and it's half an hour later. Yes. You know, and this is my experience of the work. It is continually coming back to it. There are times when I, I'm sorry, I'm just gone. There are times, and there have been times when for protracted periods I've been able to stay, for whatever reason, I don't know, circumstances, conditions around me, whatever, where I've been able to stay in a, a waking state, I would call it a waking state, and it's very, very different to, to this. Um, but are, we, are we right now, um, all of us? I'm not. I, Michael said he can't. Uh, he's got problems with his daughter. I'm not sure where Reggie is, um, and we're supposed to have a new person joining. I'm with her on Messenger, but I'm not sure why she's not able to link. And uh, I'm not sure where Martin is either. Um, hopefully, it's it's weird with all this, these time differences. Yeah. Um, but are are we all at least in this moment able to be aware of our body, to be aware of our breathing, um, to be aware of the touch of air on our skin, the touch of clothing on our body? Yes. Um, I mean, there's more to. Uh, this I'll, I'll wait. I'll give it a bit more. I, I've got a you know I've, I've been reading through uh, as I said uh, the Yale Library notes of uh, Catherine Hume, and well I'll, I'll just pull it on the screen right now, but I'll talk about it again a little bit later. Um, you know she says techniques for self observation. Uh, observe the tones of your tones of your voices or voice, your gestures, your posture, your carriage your facial expression, your weight, your temperament. Now, these are all from the inside. Yes. So, you know, your facial expression, you know, where is the tension in your face? Is it in the muscles in your face, your jaw? Are you smiling? Um, and then she says, weight, uh, not physiological, rather a feeling of heaviness, sort of on awakening in the morning or a lightness. I always feel a heaviness in the morning. I spend yes. the first 10 minutes in bed just sensing my body. I do not get out of bed right away. I really wake up inside my body. I, it's something I've been doing for years, and it took me a long time to train myself to do that. Um, so she's talking about, you know, a feeling of heaviness or lightness on awakening in the morning, you know, which is a clue to the emotional state. 
uh, temperature, not medical, but rather our emotional temperature. I mean, do we get a sudden hot flash, a cold, clammy sensation? I quite often get hot flashes when I'm talking with people because I used to suffer from extreme social anxiety. It's like something inside me kind of goes, ah, just for a second. And it's so quick, it's very hard for me to catch it, but uh, I do catch it. Um, and then she says, often the condition observed disappears upon observation. And for me, you know, catching that emotional temperature, then suddenly it's gone. Um, but at first, you know, with this self-observation, as she says here, all we are doing is getting data on ourselves. So, you know, the, 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 the tone of my voice, I can change the tone of my voice. I can make my gestures more fluid. Some people gesture a lot. Some people don't gesture. Um, you know, my posture, how I'm sitting. Um, I have a pillow behind my back. I have a problem with my back. I've got two vertebrae that are out of alignment. Um, I was born that way. They're like a V shape uh, in comparison to each other. So I've got to be very careful um, about my posture, my carriage. Um, so I'm very, very observant of my lower back. Whenever I'm sitting, there's a part of me that's aware of my lower back that uh, saying, you know, you're not sitting right, you've got to, you know, I've got a nice pillow behind me. Um, my facial expressions, sort of looking out from the outside, I, I hold a lot of tension in my face. That's where I hold a lot of negative emotions. If I'm feeling negative, it will be expressed in my face. And then, you know, wait, <coughs> and this is something I've been working on recently, because every once in a while, I know I have this emotional <coughs> within me particularly when I wake up, you know, it's like, ugh. I, I used to be even more so. I suffered from severe depression um, back in 2002 when I came back to Canada from England. And it just, I woke up in darkness. I woke up in such physical and emotional heaviness. It was unbelievable. Um, so, oh, I think Amanda's trying to join us. Um, I'm not sure if she's able to. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So to observe these things, to be aware of these things. Um, uh, there's Aman. Hi, Aman. How are you? Hi. Can you? Can't see anybody. Yeah, oh, I can see you're on the screen. Um, Hello. I'm uh, on your, I think on your, your microphone is off, Iman. Um, just sort of down on the left side of your screen, there should be some controls. Um, yeah, you want for be there, one for out with you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, but you've disappeared uh, visually. Uh, oh. Uh, uh, is is it fine if I if I just because if I put them both uh, the picture and the the sound, uh, the connection might be less. Yeah. Um. I I should mention. Um. Everything that you think you know about the Civil War in Damascus is at least a half truth. And I, um, a man is coming to us from Damascus. Um, she's actually a good friend of mine. Um, she's someone that I've known for years. She used to live in Toronto. She's a friend of my daughter's. Um, and she's been in Syria for the entire Civil War. And she lives in Damascus. Um, so just to, and, with, so, and I'm saying this, and then we won't talk about politics anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, she has full internet access. Um, you know, I've Skyped with her. I've Zoomed with her. Um, how are things there in Damascus, Iman? Um, well, things are, are, um, are better than before. Um, because this is the end of the war, but sometimes it's hard because, you know, big heads try to escalate it. There are some sides who don't want uh, this uh, uh, war to, to finish or to end. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is a little bit uh, hard, but uh, today and yesterday we didn't hear any, uh, any sound, so we don't know what's going on. Um, but I would say um, it's we've become a little bit like Iraq, so uh, no, no 
you know, like uh, sometimes no escalation, but there are bombing. Suddenly you have in an area, we have uh, suicide bombers. Uh, which kill a lot of people. So unfortunately, um, uh, this has started happening uh, the last two weeks. Uh, so we we don't know um, how it's going to end. Yeah, uh, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff talks about the awareness of death. Um, if he could do anything to uh, wake up mm -hmm. humanity, it would be to implant an organ that made us aware of our death and um, to, you know, live in a civil war, to go through a civil war um, is, you know, for, the, for those of us in the West, it's, we just don't understand it. I'm just trying to uh, um, find something else. I mean, Aman, when she was in Toronto, um, what was it, the Initiators of Peace? Mm -hmm. or what was the organization's name? Yeah, initiatives of uh, of a change, which was an organization that worked on building bridges among the divides yeah. and uh, building um, uh, peace. Uh, but uh, you know, like that was at the time of peace when I was in Toronto. Yeah. And, but when I came back to Syria, I had different programs with me but I didn't know that I was going to apply them at the time of four. Yeah, well, when she was in Toronto, she was the Ontario, which is our province chapter head of an organization called um, Creators of Peace, that uh, initiatives of change and creators of peace, which brought together, um, I'll just pull it up on the screen, um, which brought together um, Jews, Muslims, and um, Christians uh, to meet each other, to get to know each other as human beings and they have initiatives all around the world and she's continuing to do that work in Syria, in Damascus um, so you know, she's, she's got this whoops, she's got this uh, life that the rest of us can't really even imagine, um, you know, she walked out of a cafe once and uh, a few minutes later, it was no longer there and windows getting blown out. Um, so, that, I mean, that's, you know, the introduction to Iman. I, 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 I've known Iman since 2007. Um, I've, you know, she lived in Toronto for quite a few years. Um, she was a good friend of myself and my daughters. Um, wonderful person. What she's doing is just wonderful stuff. But to have lived through uh, the civil war that's going on there has been... Uh, Quite fear-inducing, I, I would imagine. Um, you know, the awareness of your death, the awareness of your mortality, the awareness of crazy people, you know, who just want to bring death um, is, is so <coughs> profound. Um, I'm not sure where everyone else is, but uh, let's just, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know where Reggie is. Uh, Michael... Uh, He's with the, uh, it's got a problem with his, uh, um, one of his daughters that he's got to help. Um, I'm not sure where Martin is. Um, so uh, let's just briefly again introduce ourselves. We'll start with you, Ian. Uh, hi, my name is Ian Reclisado. I'm in Portland, Oregon. I've been involved in the work, I want to say at least nine years on the reading front of things. Uh, this is the second group I've been a part of, and uh, I'm excited to be connected with you guys. Um, I'm also involved with some, some Buddhist traditions and have a bit of experience with um, shamanism and Taoism as well, but nothing, nothing that really stuck for too long. Um, yeah, so, and I, we've been uh, Ian and I have been Facebook friends um, for quite a few years, but it's sort of more than friends because we've exchanged a lot of private messages over the years. Um, I think I think our going back at least you know to 2013 or something. Um, so ra rather than just you know you have some Facebook friends that just read your posts and you see their posts, we've actually been in a, a fair degree of contact over the years. 
So I read I, just until a few weeks ago, I'd never I'd seen pictures of him, but <laughs> I'd never heard his voice and talked to him. Um, so um, Francis, yourself. Um, hello. Yes, I'm Francis. I'm in Dorset in England, in the southwest of England. It's a lovely sunny evening. Yeah. It's four o'clock here, four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I've been on and off, and I stress that, involved with Gurdjieff, the work for two thirds of my life, I think, probably. Um, I'm also very involved in some other things. You know, I've, I've been to India quite a lot to study various sorts of yoga, something called Suraya Yoga and what's called Karma Yoga, uh, which is similar, very, very similar to what we do. And um, I work as a therapist. I, I work particularly with people with drug and alcohol problems. And I also find this work very, very useful in addressing that. Um, in particular, it sounds surprising, but in particular, the sort of practical application of the laws of three and seven in the Enneagram, not directly or overtly, but in the background, it's extraordinarily useful in the work that I do, helping people recover from drug addiction, from alcoholism. Um, I'm very interested in some in the Enneagram. And really, it's lovely to see you all. It's lovely to be part of this. Thank you for being invited. Um, I've been, I mean, I have to say that I've, I mean, I've, I've messaged you a couple of times, Alan, just to say what, what a, a wonderful service you provide mm -hmm. by putting the stuff up. Yeah. It's really, and constant, it's the constancy, the consistency. And the, yeah, no, I know. I've been posting every day since uh, July 2016. Absolutely. Been, and it's, I mean, it's a work task. It's a real will task. It's, it is. It's a sacrifice, isn't it? It's, <laughs> You know, the word sacrifice literally means it comes from art. Like if you think of artifice to make something and sacred, it means to make something sacred. So yeah. Yeah. it's a real sacrifice that you're doing. I think it's great. And I, I read, I mean, I've read a lot of the stuff before, but it reintroduces, it reminds me. And I, I often read your passages and say, oh, I'm going to go and have a look at that. And I'm going to go and look that up yeah. and, and read more fully. So it's very, very, I find it really helpful. So thank you. Okay. That's me. Okay. Ben. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm 22 and I live in America near Washington, D.C. Um, and I guess you could say I'm here because um, I kind of came in through the typology route. So I knew the sense of like personality, different, uh, the nine types. Um, but I guess in just in typology and psychology in general, I was looking for something very practical that could be used to like make practical changes rather than just saying like this is like I guess a set of characters a set of characteristics that you have and then that's kind of like the end of it or maybe they give you problems like you know maybe that your personality type has or something like that but they don't really give you a solution to those problems per se and so just in everything I'm looking for like more self-awareness and more I guess self-understanding and making sure, you know, because I'm, I think I'm younger than everyone here, maybe. Yeah. Um, that I guess, you know, I have. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, that, you're, coming, uh, you're coming from the perspective of know thyself. Yeah. Um, that's yes. what threw you into this, to try and figure out who you are. And uh, yeah. Mr. Gurdjieff has a very interesting internal map of who we are. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the best maps that I've ever encountered. And I have a degree in psychology and studied all sorts of psychologists and different maps. Um, so this is a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what about, um, you're, you're studying music? Um, yes, I'm studying music um, and education, but now um, because of actually um, personality and psychology related things, I started learning Russian which kind of led me to start learning a bunch of other languages. So now I'd like to like teach English essentially over around the world and learn the languages of those places also. Mr. Gurdjieff was very big into learning languages. Yes. Um, he said the associative mind has to fill with associations. And this is actually, I've just been reading Catherine Hulme's uh, Yale notes and so this is in the Yale notes and 
he, this is why he used to recommend that people try to memorize 50 words in a foreign language a day. Mm. Uh, if your head brain's going to associate better than, oh, I can't believe they said that to me in this conversation and that conversation, why not learn another language? Why not use it productively mm -hmm. to memorize words rather than pull us into a state of identification? So um, hats off to you. Um, uh, Guido. Mm -hmm. um, can, you, can you introduce yourself briefly, Guido? Um, Guido's coming from Colombia, Medellin, Colombia, and South America. Um, so, I've been trying to be real since I was born. I think I, I think I was, I think I was real as, since I, since, uh, since I was born. Uh, uh, children have the capacity to be aware of themselves and as uh, we all know uh, as uh, as the time passed by we 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 become we 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 lose the uh, associations with uh, we are with self and um, well uh, went to I went to study my bachelor uh, the studies and, and uh, End up and went to the United States in 1973. At the end of the Vietnam War, and uh, it was it was very difficult. But I uh, started uh, started studying English as a second language, and uh, I very well uh, <clears throat> learned I, how. Yeah. I very well learned okay. how. To Guido, I'm gonna I'm gonna just fast forward this slightly. Late 1970s, the director Peter Brook uh, came to introduce the film Meetings with Remarkable Men in Colombia, and you went there. You met him. You knew uh, Natalie de Salzman, Madame de Salzman's daughter. Um, you worked in numerous groups in uh, South America. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? In 1977, I went to an island here in Colombia, and then the, the main city uh, <clears throat> from the islands, uh, the name is Buenaventura, Buenaventura. Buenaventura is a coastal city near uh, the city where I, was, where I was born. And I was walking by the streets before I took, before I take the bo boat, the boat, to, to, to go to an island, a little island, and uh, somebody was selling books on the street, to display on the on the street, and I took in search of the miracles, in search of, in search of miracles, and I, I have a, I it grabbed my attention the name of the name of that book, you know, so I bought it, I went to the island, and I couldn't stop reading it all the time, many times, and you know, I read it from. It's a small book. I don't know. I don't know exactly if it's set for the miracle, but well, it's a small book that talks about the evolution. But I think it's Spencer wrote it. Yeah, no, I think you're talking about the psychology of man's possible evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, ah. that one. Yeah. So that introduced me to the good years ideas immediately. So I came back in 1970, in 1979. So that was in 1977, and uh, in 1979, I was already in a group of studies, the ideas of good youth. And Peter Brook came out to Colombia. Peter Brooks came to come to Colombia to Bogota and Medellin to introduce himself as a di director of the movie. Do you know? Do you know the movie? Mm -hmm. Meetings with okay. Remarkable Men. Yeah. Yeah. So we went to the premiere of the movie in, in the whole world. Uh, um, and I continue studying. And I continue to study the, to, to be in the groups for, since then to, to still now, you know. So we, some years of, uh, without going to any groups, because I moved from, from, from that city to, to, uh, to Medellin, and I initiated, I was one of the, the, the one, I was one of the ones 
uh, you shade the group in here in Medellin, a group that lasts about 15 years. Yeah. I knew somebody, and that somebody was interested in esoteric uh, things. And, and I talked, talked to him about Gurdjieff, and he was, he was very interested in it. We went to Cali, and Cali was the, the main city of Colombia to uh, that day that uh, have the direction from Venezuela. Yeah, uh, uh, with Natalie, the uh, Sassman, and uh, many other interesting people that uh, uh, that knew Gurdjieff, you know, in real life. And they were, they were all based in Venezuela, but you had connections with them. Yeah, I, 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 I used to go every year to Venezuela to uh, Jornada. You know, it's a, Jornada is like a retirement yeah. of 15 days in the jungle. Yeah. In the jungle, um, completely dedicated to movements, you know, sacred dances, talking with Natalie, mm -hmm. talking with other interesting people, you know. Uh, that uh, uh, follow following the, the, the other, the many, many exercises, you know, mm -hmm. lectures, talking, dancing, uh, eating, good eating, you know, because, uh, uh, as you know, would they like would they feel like the banquets and so the eating was very good. Okay, um, Aman, well, yeah, I'm just going to move on because we don't we we, we want to keep the time. Aman, um, you don't really yeah. know a lot about Gurji except through me. Um, yeah. But you know, what about yourself? Uh, I mean, I know that you're very much on the spiritual path. Um, uh, you teach English? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I teach English uh, um, in Syria, and I do counseling and uh, uh, support, uh, personal support, uh, especially at this time of the war. Um, um, I'm, you know, like uh, I studied uh, about Christianity and Judaism a little bit. I still don't know, but. I'm interested in learning about other cultures and religions and faith and paths because as someone who is so uh, involved in building peace, unless we know each other, we cannot make peace with each other. So uh, this is something I'm working on, uh, but we're trying to focus on starting the change from the self, not only to tell people do this and do that. Unless we change ourselves, we cannot change the situations we are uh, surrounded by. So yeah, this is basically. And I was in England uh, two weeks ago. Um, uh, I just came um, uh, last last Wednesday, so I'm sorry I couldn't join. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, you were in England uh, with the Initiators of Peace. Um, yes. talking to people over there and holding workshops and, uh, um, yeah. you know, building bridges, building bridges, you know, of people who have grown up and were taught to be enemies. And this is, you know, one of the, the goals of that organization is to humanize the other. So to, you know, to put a face mm -hmm. to Jews, to put a face to Muslims and Christians. And um, it's a very noble work. Um, now, if I may, yeah, go ahead, Ben. If, if, if I may ask, um, I'm very what exactly started conflict in that area of the world, yeah. exactly? If you could say that like in a really short... Probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, it started as... Um, uh, well, you know, like if I want to talk about it from my, uh, <laughs> from my own perspective after eight years, uh, it's been um, planned for a long time ago. Uh, and it is... Uh, it started, it's political, taking advantage of certain problems of inter or inner problems inside the country. So uh, our inner problems could have been solved, but there are outer sides and forces that have been uh, raging it in order to be big, 
for political problems. But I always say, if your house is clean, no one can dare to um, to mess it up. So we are we are responsible as well. But it's it's really bigger than uh, than us, and not everything on the media is correct, honestly. So. Yeah, yeah, ben, 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 just quickly, um, Syria was one of the most ethnically and religiously diverse countries in the Middle East. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they had the Alawats, they had the Sunnis, they had the Shiites, they had Christians, mm -hmm. they had Druze, and these people had all been living in harmony for centuries. And then, you know, people from the outside started agitating um, mm -hmm. and started trying to break them up along sectarian lines. And in particular, Saudi Arabia with the Wahhabism, um, supporting a certain faction of people. And, you know, the whole, w when the Middle East was divided up during the First World War, it wasn't divided up along tribal lines. They wanted to separate the tribes to create disunity and weakness. And Syria mm -hmm. was multiple tribes all in one. And uh, they, they were fairly peaceful coexisting but outside agitators and outside forces. But at any rate, let's just uh, do an inner exercise. And mm -hmm. all inner exercises should rightfully begin with the reason why we are doing them. And within the, you know, uh, in, uh, in Search of the Miraculous by Uspensky, um, recounting his conversations with uh, Mr. Gurdjieff, he said uh, George Gurdjieff told him that all work should be done along two lines, or three lines, for the self, uh, for the group, and for the work. I actually prefer to expand that. Um, I believe work should be done for myself, uh, for my fellow human beings, and for the earth itself. Now, this is something interesting I, I've been talking about. Um, excuse me, reading Catherine Mansfield, or Catherine Hume's notes. Uh, in it, Mr. Gurdjieff says that essence is like the physical body, you know, um, in that, she said, we should say, I am and I have a physical body. Not I am a physical body. I am and I have a physical body. But in that, she also says that Mr. Gurdjieff told her that our essence is of a substance that we share with every other person on this planet. So, you know, the essential self, the self that exists in world uh, 24 within the planetary realm we're part of a collective essence a collective identity so uh, um, she said in the in the notes that uh, mr. Gurdjie said that everyone else at the center at the level of essence is really somehow an expression of ourselves as well so working at the essential level at the real I that's where we are all one the real I is something different but you know, it was very interesting, you know, back then she, they, they used the uh, figure 2,000 million, which was 2 billion uh, people in the world back then that uh, we shared a common essence. So for me, you know, work for myself, work for my fellow human beings, and work for the planet. Um, because we are a species on this planet. We are the most uh, you know, we're, 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 we're the, like uh, Mr. Gertz just said, we're like the brain cells of the planet. Um, to think of ourselves as separate from the planet, to think of ourselves as distinct from the planet is really uh, a, 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 a massive act of ego. Um, I, I saw a YouTube uh, documentary last night that showed a human embryo on the head of a pin. And the human embryo was much smaller than the head of a pin. And we all started out as that human embryo. And we started pulling these resources from the planet, the iron, the magnesium, the minerals into our body. And our bodies, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff called them the planetary body. They really are one with the planet. Um, so we really are a part of the planet at the physical level within our bodies. So let's just, you know, to think that we're doing this for ourselves, that we are doing this for our fellow human beings and that we are doing this for the planet. As we work on ourselves, we work on all three dimensions. So begin by becoming conscious of your breath and breathing, uh, sensing 
your breathing, sensing your breath, the flow of air up through your nostrils to the bridge of your nose down into your lungs. Try to sense this journey of air. And I've, it's been implied to me that it's very important also to be aware of the air at the bridge of your nose. That's where, you know, there are blood vessels and everything, and there's a thin uh, connection uh, between that part of the airways and things going into the brain. And it's possible that uh, we are absorbing some of the higher particles in the air at that place. Um, but through conscious breathing, through becoming aware of our breath and our body breathing, we change something within us. Uh, J.G. Bennett said that this is how we accumulate the higher particles we need for the alchemical process of inner transformation. So in order for our impressions to move beyond the uh, Dove 48 up, in order for our octave of air to move up from uh, Me 48, we need higher particles, higher molecules. And uh, according to J.G. Bennett, we breathe these in. And we do this through the conscious awareness of our breath and our breathing. And this is interesting because in the Buddha's great discourse on mindfulness, he said, first become aware of the air passing in and out our nostrils, then become aware of the flow of air into our body, and then become aware of our whole body breathing. And by doing this, by doing this conscious awareness, we are bringing those higher particles that have to blend with the lower to create this alchemical transformation within us. So become aware of your breathing. Just sense your breathing, become aware of the flow of air, the movement of muscles, the posture of your body as you breathe. Become aware of your whole body breathing. Just focus on the air, on the breath of breathing. Now, we have two hemispheres. We have a right and left cerebral hemisphere. And usually our cerebral hemispheres are out of balance. They're operating at a different frequency. The dominance shifts back and forth throughout the day. Just as if you notice your breath now, you're going to be breathing more through one nostril than another, but within the approximately an hour and a half to two hours, that will change and we're not really aware of it, but we breathe you know, from different nostrils, different sides back and forth throughout the day. Um, but there's a state that's called hemispheric synchronization. So if we can imagine a line that cuts our body down the center, that runs down between our eyes, our nose, the center of our chest, down the center of our body, and if we can just become, for instance, aware of the right side of our body, and then become aware, conscious, observing the left side of our body, aware of the right side again, and then aware of the left. And it's always good to do things in three, so aware of our right side again, and then aware of the left side of our body. We can begin to get a distinction between these two halves of ourselves. But we can also divide the body along a medium point, along our pelvis, so we can become aware of the bottom of our body, our hips, uh, buttocks, legs, feet, or the top, of our body, so our torso, our arms, our head. So become aware of the bottom of your body. Become aware of the top of your body, and let's do this a third time. Become aware of the bottom of your body, and to become aware of the top of your body. Now this is a wonderful exercise if you are feeling uh, a strong emotion, if you're depressed, if you're despairing, um, uh, brain scans indicate that a lot of those strong emotions come from the back right part of our brain, deep in the brain, and it kind of cascades over. But it starts in an area and uh, in the back here. And they say if we can achieve a state of whole brain balance, of hemispheric synchronization, we can stop these. So for my clients who suffer from depression, despair, where they often feel an overwhelming emotion, um, I tell them to do this. And it's an exercise that I call contralateral 
self-sensing. So we divide the body down the center and we divide the body from the, the bottom and the top. And so the contralateral point of my right arm is my left leg. Um, and they found that when we become aware of contralateral points of our body, it leads to this whole brain state of hemispheric synchronization, and it helps to balance us. So this is my, my, my prelude to this exercise. So again, become aware of your breath and breathing. Become aware of the air that flows in through your nose, nasal cavity, you know, the bridge of your nose, back of your mouth, down into your lungs and back out again. Really become aware of the sensation of air as it flows in and then flows back out. And then become aware of the movement of the muscles, your diaphragm, abdomen, the muscles between the ribs. Try to become aware of both the sensation of air, the movement of the muscles, and then try to add the third component, the sensation of air, the movement of the muscles, and an awareness of your whole body breathing. Just become aware of your body. Become aware of your body breathing. Bring this ability to observe your body, to observe your breath, this mindful awareness into your body, and be aware of your body breathing. And then I'm going to lead us down contralateral points of the body and back up contralateral points of the body and in doing so this will allow us to achieve this whole brain state so become aware of your right shoulder and left hip your right shoulder and left hip together at the same time and then become aware of your right upper arm and left upper leg your right upper arm and left upper leg your right elbow and left knee, your right elbow and left knee. And then become aware of your right lower arm and your left lower leg, your right lower arm and your left lower leg. And then become aware of your right wrist and your left ankle, your right wrist, and your left ankle. And then become aware of the top of your right hand and the top of your left foot. The top of your right hand, the top of your left foot. And then become aware of your right thumb and your left big toe. Your right thumb and your left big toe. And then become aware of your right index finger and your left second toe, your right index finger and left second toe. Your right middle finger and left middle toe. Your right middle <coughs> finger and your left <coughs> middle toe. And then become aware of your right fourth finger and your left fourth toe, your right fourth finger and left fourth toe, your right baby finger and left baby toe, your right baby finger and left baby toe, the palm of your right hand and the bottom of your left foot, the palm of your right hand and the bottom of your left foot. Now reversing this process and becoming aware of the bottom of your left foot and the palm of your right hand. The, excuse me, the, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, we're gonna go down to the hip. Um, the right hip and the left shoulder. The right hip and the left shoulder. I'm just trying to figure out how to turn up off other microphones and I can't do that and do this exercise at the same time. Um, the right hip and the left shoulder. Um, the right upper leg and the left upper arm. The right upper leg and the left upper arm. Becoming aware of the right knee and the left elbow. The right knee and the left elbow. Becoming aware of the right lower leg and the left lower arm. The right lower leg and the left lower arm. 
the right ankle and the left wrist, the right ankle and the left wrist, the top of your right foot and the top of your left hand, the top of your right foot, the top of your left hand, your right big toe and left thumb, your right big toe and left thumb, your right second toe and left index finger, your right second toe and left index finger, your right middle toe and left middle finger, your right middle toe and left middle finger, your right fourth toe and left fourth finger, your right fourth toe and left fourth finger, your right baby toe and your left baby finger, your right baby toe and your left baby finger, the bottom of your right foot and the palm of your left hand, the bottom of your right foot and the palm of your left hand. And now reversing this process, become aware of the bottom of your left foot and the palm of your right hand, the bottom of your left foot and the palm of your right hand, your left baby toe and right baby finger, your left baby toe and right baby finger, your left fourth toe and right fourth finger, your left fourth toe and right fourth finger, your left middle toe and right middle finger, your left middle toe and right middle finger, your left second toe and right index finger, left second toe and right index finger, your left thumb or your left big toe and right thumb, your left big toe and right thumb, the top of your left foot and the top of your right hand, the top of your left foot and the top of your right hand, your left ankle and right wrist, left ankle and right wrist, your left lower leg and right lower arm, your left lower leg and right lower arm, your left knee and right elbow, your left knee and right elbow, your left upper leg and right upper arm, your left upper leg and right upper arm, your left hip and right shoulder, your left hip and right shoulder, the palm of your left hand and the bottom of your right foot, the palm of your left hand and the bottom of your right foot, your left index or your left baby finger and your right baby toe, your left baby finger and your right baby toe, your left fourth finger and right fourth toe, your left fourth finger and your right fourth toe, your left middle finger and right middle toe, your left middle finger and right middle toe, your left index finger and right second toe, your left index finger and right second toe, your left thumb and right big toe, your left thumb and right big toe, the top of your left hand and the top of your right foot, the top of your left hand and the top of your right foot, your left wrist and right ankle, your left wrist and right ankle, your left lower arm and right lower leg, your left lower arm and right lower leg, your left elbow and right knee, your left elbow and right knee, your left upper arm and right upper leg, your left upper arm and right upper leg, and your left shoulder and right hip, your left shoulder and right hip. And then simply become aware of your right arm and your left leg, your right arm and your left leg. And then become aware of your right leg and left arm, your right leg and left arm. And then become aware of your left leg and right arm, your left leg and right arm. And then your left arm and right leg, your left arm and right leg. And then your right arm and your left leg, your right arm and left leg. 
your right leg and left arm, your right leg and left arm, your left leg and right arm, your left leg and right arm, and then your left arm and your right leg, your left arm and your right leg. And then just take a moment and just observe within yourself. Observe the balance of your right and your left side from your bottom and your top. Try to note what this feels like, what this state internally feels like. Perhaps even notice it in terms of your perceptions, in terms of your forehead, um, the part of your brain that exists behind your forehead. Try to observe what this balanced whole brain state feels like. And a final note, um, all inner exercises actually involve the observer observing. And so try to just slip back ever so slightly to be the observer observing your body, the observer observing your body breathing, the observer observing your body perhaps from the bottom of your feet all the way up to the top of your head. Just try to awaken in whatever way you can that observer that is always there watching. It is the witness witnessing our body. It is the witness witnessing ourselves on the outside. Try to become aware if in whatever way you can of that observer, that witness, that behind everything there's an element of you that is consciousness itself that is aware of these things now it's always important to keep some of the work that we do for ourselves within ourselves and so ending our inner exercises is also a very important uh, uh, process and uh, so can you repeat silently in your mind after me May results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being and are there any uh, observations any comments um, that anyone would like to make um, about this? Nothing but extraordinary. That's exactly the way I used to be teach the, uh, to how to do meditation in, in such every word you express. Okay. And I know the group, the, 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 the work from Venezuela with the Madame Natalie Sassman is herself. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's good to know. <laughs> Any other comments? Does anyone notice this balancing going on within themselves? Um, yes. I know it feels. Oh. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> uh, I'll I'll be brief. Um, yeah, I, I noticed it. Um, kind of. Uh, as the exercise went on, it felt deeper and deeper in, in my body. Um, and by the time we, we got to the end of it, I, I, I just wanted to keep going. There was this, it, it felt a little uh, unnatural or unusual, um, but it very, uh, I don't, what's the word? Very good, very pleasant, uh, but that doesn't quite do it justice. Just very, very present. Um, yeah. Right, ben. ben? I was going to say, I noticed it, it feels different depending on the level of sleep that you've had. <laughs> so today I slept more than usual, but like, I guess if you sleep like maybe five or six hours, it feels like a little different, but that's interesting. Okay. Anyone else have any comments on this? Yes. It's a similar, similar process to doing the movements. Um, you know, in, in the movements, one is 
well, you, 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 it, it is about that. You know, your left leg is doing one thing, your right arm is doing another thing, your head is doing, and it's about the attention that you bring yeah. to all these dis different parts. So it has the same kind of impact. Sorry, just had to move. <laughs> so it has the same, the same effect, the same impact. Um, yeah. yeah, you're one of the fortunate ones because you get to do movements every it. week. Um, no, no group meeting, just movements meeting, which uh, I'm jealous of. Uh, I think there should be, you know, for every 10 yoga studios, there should be one movement studio that uh, people can attend. And uh, They should, yes, I agree. I don't know whether people would attend because they're not easy. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not, I mean, they're not... Most of it you have to learn by imitation. They are taught, but you're not sort of given. Yeah. And there's a lot of different movements, yeah. and some of them are really difficult. Things like the walking prayer. Do you did you ever do the walking? Prayer? Um, I was just, I did movements for a year, and I'm not sure exactly. It was over ten years ago, okay. so it's okay. been a while. Um, there, there is one aspect, I and mean, I was going to, going to mention this, but but in a minute, uh, you were talking about. But the flow of associations and staying present. I was, there is a sort of a kind of movements exercise which is about this. And when we're talking about languages, and Ben, you said you speak Russian, one of the things we do, there's a lot of counting in Russian in the movements. Mm. But backwards, oh, wow. and forth. so you've got rasp, bar, tree, tree, and you're going back. <laughs> and this, at the same time, your arm is doing something over here, your feet, are, you know, and it really does focus you. Um, so yes, the movements, I, I love them. I'm not, some of them are, I can do, some are a few years away. But, but they, they do lead to the whole brain state, they really do. They very much do, yes. They do. Um, and they're very good for focusing. And I was gonna say, you know, when we were talking about your brain wandering and you're sitting there, I was gonna show you, if it's appropriate, a little exercise that you can do based on the movements, which can actually focus your attention very much in the moment. Um, I don't want to interrupt your, your flow. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, I lost my awareness because I know that there's some control where I could turn off the other mics, but I still haven't found it. And that's where I got, you know, the bottom of the right hand and the bottom of the left foot, and then I mix it up. Uh, and the other thing that I, I usually do this with my clients, um, it's part of the hypnotic process, for me leading them into a hypnotic state, and if I pay attention to my own body and their body, I get messed up. I have to focus on their body because, yes. you know, to do, to be, to do it, it's actually, uh, I, I mean, to become aware of my body, to move, you know, down one side of my body, up the other, it's fairly easy, but uh, to be aware of both parts and to speak them um, just gets me to that level where, you know, that, that between my competency and my incompetency and that's where we really want to be. We want to live at that, that position, that level between competency and uh, incompetency. Absolutely. So doing this online, while the only reference I can do is in myself, it's, it, it adds a level of uh, um, difficulty for me. So it was interesting to notice it from the inside. Um, it's great. Um, any yeah. other comments? Guido, Iman, any comments? Um, well, um, I've, I've noticed that, um, you know, like uh, when I was focusing on the left side of me, um, I've, uh, it was a kind of image, um, uh, there was a kind of image like light, like there was really huge light. Um, and uh, when I was focusing on my right side, um, I felt like I was, um, I just needed more breath, breath, uh, air as if I, I couldn't breathe. And um, um, also I felt like there was a kind of animal inside me. I don't know what it was, but that what I felt like this is the image, something like an animal went out of me. Uh, so, um, but I felt warm. I felt, uh, at the end I felt warm and uh, I'm suffering lately from um, um, backache and I felt like it was um, uh, it was you know like located in the right uh, part of the hip 
and now I feel like it went down, like uh, it, it wasn't in one area, it's just expanding, which is good because it's one area was really giving me a hard time. So it's like as if it's uh, releasing or going away. So yeah, that's it. No, no, that's, a, that's a good observation um, between the right and the, the left side. Uh, they say the left side is the feminine side and the right side is the masculine side. Um, so I know that Ian has problems with tension. Um, he can feel it in down parts of his right side, um, just sort of like his body, bodily, physical identification. And it's interesting, Yvonne, that you noticed uh, lightness. Um, and are you talking about light as an illumination or light as in the sensation of light, like, you know, light and heavy or light and dark? No, light and dark. Light and dark. So the illumination. That's an interesting yeah. uh, observation. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, I'm going to just pull it on the screen. Um, some of you were here at sort of earlier. Um, this comes from the uh, notes. There's something like 131 pages that are in the Yale Library that were donated uh, by the estate of uh, Catherine Hume. And uh, Catherine Hume uh, was one of the ladies of the rope. Uh, uh, the first group that Mr. Gurdjieff began to work with in the 1930s. He stopped doing group work and individual work after his automobile accident in 1924, uh, where he nearly died. And he came out of the coma and he recovered and he realized that he had to put his ideas down in writing um, or else they could be lost. And he spent, you know, years working on his uh, major book and then, uh, you know, these people like Catherine Hume um, were members of Jane Heap's Paris group. And they heard that uh, Mr. Gurdjieff uh, would often go and write at the Café de la Paix in Paris. And uh, so they, set, they went there one day and they saw someone and they said, I think that's Mr. Gurdjieff because of his hat and the way he looked. And uh, they got invited to, for dinner the next day or that night, uh, what they called a crayfish dinner. And... Then they started going to the Café de la Paix and sitting and watching him and hoping, well, either knowing that they would either be ignored or invited over, and they kept on doing that day after day after day. And Mr. Gurdjieff started to invite them over and work with them. And uh, she became a writer. Um, you know, she, she, her books are, um, I think she... Um, might have written the nun story. I'm not sure. Um, that became, you know, the basis of the TV show um, uh, back in the '60s. But um, you know, there's a whole group of uh, of women, and they were mostly lesbian women who were uh, drawn around Mr. Gurdjieff. And uh, one of the books I think I may have shared is uh, uh, Gurdjieff and the Woman of the Rope, which are just transcripts. They would go out and you know, right after they talked to him, they would all get together and they would try and recall the exact words of the conversation they had with him. They didn't put a lot of inner exercises in that. The inner exercises, um, they kept to themselves. But this, uh, she wrote down, um, technique for self-observation. Um, earlier in this manuscript, I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, let me see if I can bring that up. I've got it in a different version. I've... Uh, um, uh, just give me one second. Um, I'm not sure if I can or not. Um, I may have to stop sharing. Just let me stop sharing for a second. And um, what she talks about in, yeah, here it is. Um, let me try and uh, just give me one second. Um, um, oops. Here it is. Um, she talked about the psychology of the future, um, the only way of the Buddha. We see immediately that this impersonal observation of the three automatic functions of our organism as objective facts, entirely as objective and unrelated to anything properly called ourselves as in any other mechanisms of nature, 
such, for example, as the ocean tides, is precisely, and this was actually underlined, so where I have comments, it was underlined in her manuscript, <laughs> a fourth <coughs> possible activity for human beings. This process is not a physical action, nor an emotional activity, neither must it be a thought. The valid distinction between being conscious of something and thinking about it is the significant thing here. It is also plain that for each of us, the field of observation is confined, certainly at the moment, to our own bodies. We cannot be directly aware of a cool breeze, but we can be conscious of the physical effects on our bodies, or the physical effects produced by it on our bodies. Thus, we conclude upon consideration that we are dealing here with a fourth activity differing from the other three at least equally as much as they differ from each other. It is not a physical action. It is not a feeling. It is not a thought. It is awareness. Um, oops. So, you know, and uh, I'll bring this back up again. Um, well, I think I've lost the uh, size. Um, if I can somehow, I don't think I can increase the size from here. Um, so, I mean, you know, that's to me, um, where is everything? Um, where are my controls? Stop share. To me, that is so profound so incredibly profound and you know when you realize that he was instructing them in the 1930s uh you know john kabat-zinn mindfulness meditation has entered the west um you know it's been seeping in uh since the late 70s 1979 when kabat-zinn uh, opened the center for mindfulness-based studies but back then you know at rene descartes uh, i think therefore i am um, people really elevated the thoughts and the thinking process and thought that we were thinking beings. And, you know, to imagine the extent of what Mr. Gurdjieff had to do to take people to that level of awareness, to become aware of awareness itself, and to train people and convince them how important it is. Um, so to become aware of these things, and let me... Uh, um, just try to, uh, I'm just going to, uh, whoops, I don't know what happened. Um, I'm, uh, I'll pull this one up now again, um, on the screen. Oh, Reggie joined us. Um, your screen, um, your microphone's off, Reggie. Um, if you can get your microphone on, but, uh, the, the share screen. Yeah. So, you know, this is uh, oh, probably 20 pages later in that book. I'm not sure exactly. Techniques <laughs> for self-observation. And this is really more for the physical in a sense, but there's somewhat emotional as well. The tones of our voice. Um, as a communicator, as a hypnotherapist, um, you take courses in hypnotherapy and they tell you that when you raise the tone at the end of a sentence, it turns it into a question. So you can hear me, can you? Whereas if you flatten it, it's like a sort of observation. You can hear me, can you? And when you lower it, you can hear me, can you? It becomes a command. So I play with tones of my voice all the time and realizing that when I speak fast, certain things, and I speak slow, but my voice is very much tied and my tones of voice very much tied to my voice box, to my moving center. Um, languages, particularly when spoken, is very much a moving center phenomenon. Um, and then gestures. Um, I gesture quite a lot. Uh, sometimes I've been told I gesture too much and I use my hands in speaking. Um, so to become aware of our gestures, our movements, to become aware of our posture. Um, how we're sitting, how we're standing, um, to become aware of our carriage. This is sort of our body, the movement of our body, how we carry ourselves. 
uh, to become aware of our facial expressions. Um, a lot of people uh, of my clients, for instance, they have negative emotions in their stomach, uh, um, you know, their, 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 their solar plexus. I found that uh, for myself, I carry a lot of negative emotions in my face. And to, to relax my face is a way to get rid of a lot of those negative emotions. And then, you know, weight, she says, not physiological, not our, the weight on a scale, but rather the feeling. So she's using the word feeling here, which is an emotion, a feeling of heaviness. So when we wake up in the morning, do we feel heavy? Is there sort of a general malaise, a heaviness in our feeling? Or is there a lightness? And then, uh, um, you know, these are clues to our emotional state. Uh, then our temperature, you know, not the medical temperature of the thermometer, but our emotional temperature, a sudden hot flash, cold, clammy feeling. Um, and as she said here, often the conditions observed disappear upon observation. But at first, with this self-observation, all we are doing is gathering data on ourselves so um very interesting i i, I just as i said uh you know I've, I've been reading through those it's one of the things that i had never paid attention to and then someone uh, posted a clip uh, or a little segment on one uh facebook uh group and i thought i should pay more attention to that and it's very interesting um her her typed notes they get repetitive because you read them and then it's like they're repeated, parts of them are repeated and then parts of them are repeated in pencil. So there's like three different versions, which uh, things come in threes. So it's a very interesting thing. I will post, uh, I'll post them on the, uh, on the group uh, um, meet up, or not meet up, on the uh, message board and you'll be able to just download them from there and read them, they're very interesting. Um, uh, Reggie, how are you doing? How's Mexico? Reggie's coming from Mexico. Yeah, good. Uh, sorry for being late and I have trouble with uh, my computer, but I'm here. You're here uh, now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. How, how's the weather in Mexico? Um, it's uh, hot, I think. It's, you know, nice. Is, is that a rooster <laughs> in the background we hear? It is. It is a rooster. <laughs> I have like five or six roosters right here, so they are all the time singing. <laughs> yeah. He lives in the country, uh, so he's not in any major city. He's in a small town in, uh, in Mexico. Very small. Ah, again. <laughs> There's the rooster. Um, any, any comments? Anyone want to comment on the quote uh, by Catherine Hume and uh, what I talked about earlier? Anyone want to say anything on this? Um, no. Francis? I wasn't saying anything. No. Just, okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yes, I agree with this. Um, anyone else? I I like the, the I don't know I like the part about the facial expressions yeah. um, and what you were saying about carrying the negative emotion in our and the tension in our face. Um, last week, Francis had mentioned something I think to me, but to the group about um, feeling into the, the eyes and the muscles around the eyes and the, the nerve at the back of the eye. Um, and I've been, I've been doing that kind of off and on this week. And I noticed a, a lot of anger and hatred uh, when, it's, when, I, when I sense into that area and, I, I, and it feels very tense. It's almost like it, it's pulling in, the tension is, is tightening to sort of block any kind of flow and then there's just this kind of anger that there's something something heavy and gross kind of tight that comes out um and you to see the, that from the inside was was really interesting you read the newspapers and watch the tv um no i'm most mostly a computer guy so <laughs> i read the internet and i watch the internet be careful of the websites okay. <laughs> In one, it's in in one sense, it's it's, but we don't live in the world that we, this is one thing I've come to realise having done this, and it sounds I can't put it any any less strange than this, but we don't live in the world that we think we live in, and we're not the creatures that we think we are, and we're a lot more vulnerable. 
to, let's say, influences from below, from the lower world, because that's nature, you know? And we think the whole, you know, all the stuff that comes at us, I mean, you were talking, Alan, earlier about angles. I mean, there's a whole pool below us, if you like, and it's a very powerful pool of anger, of fear, of shame, of all this stuff that make it different. And it's kind of like subterranean. Yeah. And the influences, like, like the internet, the media, they drill into it. And we get sucked in and it kind of comes off. And it, of course it's in your eyes, that's what you're looking at. Uh, that sounds a bit glib, but seeing is not a one-way thing. Interesting, we're talking about awareness. Nobody knows how we see things. One of the things I'm really interested in is artificial intelligence. One of the big stumbling blocks in building an artificial human being is how on earth do we see stuff? And it only takes a moment's thought to, you, when you're looking at something, you, 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 you're aware it's over there. It's not on a screen in your head. How, how's that happening? Seeing is an extraordinary process. And we, it's something we can't replicate artificially. So, again, because, because of the sleep state that we're in, we exist on a level where we're just not aware of all sorts of things that are going on all the time. Probably just as well. I think it would be terrifying if we suddenly woke up with no preparation and, you know, we're in the real world, as Gurdjieff says. Yeah. Yeah. But, I don't know. It may be that. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, one thing, you know, in terms of facial expressions, um, and maybe this week we should really try to become aware of our facial expressions. Try just to focus on that. Um, one yeah. exercise that I like doing is when I'm, you know, in a cafe, if I'm by myself or I'm on the subway or on the bus, is I look at other people and I try to adopt their facial expressions in order to inwardly experience what they are experiencing emotionally. Um, I sometimes run communication uh, meetups where I teach, you know, I get people to, to look at each other. This is an NLP um, exercise. You look at someone and you try and read their mind. Uh, you know, you have one person trying to imagine a memory and whatever of some emotional kind. The other person tries to read their mind and then you do it again and you start pacing them. You start breathing along with them. You start trying to adopt their posture. You try to adopt their facial expression and then you try to read their mind again and your ability to do it dramatically increases. Uh, and what I notice as well is, you know, particularly people over about the age of 65, you think, oh. Okay. Sorry, uh, I'm, I need to. Go, I need to log off. Okay, hey, man, no problem. Take uh, care. Okay. I'm sorry. Bye. 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 Well, that must have been a rocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, God. <laughs> that's, well, it's scary because uh, she's a real close friend of mine. <laughs> um, yeah. to, did some kind of rocket going overhead. Um, yeah. I could feel that in my body when I realized what it was. At first, it sounded like a dog, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, I know she, she doesn't have a dog. Um, so, um, in our in our faces, um, for people over the age of sixty five, you can look at a lot of them, and you can see the dominant negative emotion that they've held on to their whole life because it wears itself into their faces, into the wrinkles in their faces into the way they hold themselves. And, you know, sometimes it's quite sad. Uh, you know, I feel like saying to them, you know, you should just smile, smile. You should do more smiling. And I see young people and, you know, it's like some of them are like sucking lemons. <laughs> and it's no, smile, bring that joy into your face. Bring that joy into your eyes. Um, the most significant place we can smile is through our eyes. Um, you know, they're smiling with the lips, the zygomatic major and minor muscles that go to the top of our lips. But then there's the abicularis oculi. It's a, it's a ribbon-like muscle that circles around our eyes and allows us to squint. And learning to smile with that muscle is very important. 
and learning to smile with the whole face and being aware of where we hold our emotions in our face is uh, quite revealing. Uh, um, I want to say for me, um, in terms of like the facial expressions, I feel like a lot of weight on the sides. But surprisingly, if I focus more on it, then it only gets stronger. Okay. Do, so, what, what's the corollary emotion uh, that you feel inside when you feel that heaviness? Is it an emotional heaviness? Is it a, something that pulls you? Or I think it's kind of like, in some ways, like distress, I would say. Okay. Or uncomfort. Can you elaborate? Um, I mean, I'm trying to get you to go a little bit deeper into it. Right, right. Um, I think it's like, I don't know, maybe it's like hiding or something or like, I don't want to show like how I feel. So it's kind of like tense right there or, but I'm not exactly sure. But just in terms of the face, there's always been like a lot of a weight, like right on the sides, like right here. And but I, I mean, you, you say he, not, not showing it, or does it only manifest socially? Or can you feel it when you're in the room by yourself, just sitting there, perhaps surfing the internet or whatever? Uh, I think actually only socially. Only socially. Oh, pr primarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, right. So that mm -hmm. tells you something. So only socially. So that's a social emotion. It's something that you learned from your social environment. Um, and you said it's a heaviness. Um, uh, it's an attempt to hide yourself. I guess since it, like if I feel it, I can kind of go like, like hmm, yeah. But it's kind of like more like bringing more attention to like this this feeling right here. So you can kind of like you know go like that, or you know maybe like that, or have some type of you know facial expression that kind of blocks that area right there. Okay. Uh, do, do you notice it? Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to, to do this now, but do you notice it when you're with good friends or is it with strangers? Um, um, I think it goes away with good friends. I think only with strangers. What about with your family? Um, you're, you're the youngest of a big family by six years. So, yes. you know, is it four siblings that you have? Um, is it four? I'm sorry. Do you have four siblings, brothers and sisters? Four si yes, yes. But you're the youngest, and the next one is six years older than you. Is that something yeah. that you feel in terms of your family? Um, sort of that hiding away and, you know, the... Yes. <laughs> okay, so your family and strangers are people who are not good friends, but with your good friends, it's not there. Um, yes. And when you, I assume when you're playing music, it's not there as well. Uh, yes, unless I'm nervous. Unless you're nervous. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, these are interesting. You know, I'm, I'm just using, you know, this is what I do with my clients. I just question, question, try to bring these awarenesses up. So pay attention to that this week. Pay attention to where you, you hold these things in yourself. Um, and, and sometimes even like socially when I, you know, I guess if someone like laughs or something or, you know, tells a funny joke and you can see that they want you to like, you know, be more like expressive or, you know, kind of mirror their emotions. I can kind of, you know, I can kind of like try to smile, but then there's like the weight, it kind of gets stronger. And it's like this weird tension. Have you heard the expression external considering? Or internal no. considering? Basically, um, internal considering is about worrying about what other people think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very big deal in the fourth way. Yeah. Good. It's one mm -hmm. of the big diseases that mankind has is about worrying about what other people can think. And one thing you might be able to just watch is how much power you give to other people, how much you're concerned about what they're thinking about you, and that will get trapped in the face. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know it's a very useful thing. And as Alan says, just you are aware of your face and that will feed back to you what's going on in, 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 in your emotional almost, if you see what I mean. Yes, yes. Anyway, I have to go, I'm afraid. It's, it's... Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, we're going to just wrap it up in about the next five minutes. But if you need to go, Francis, I it's do. great having you here. I'm glad I mean, you made it. Um, you know, I'm glad you didn't go to the wedding yesterday. Uh... <laughs> no, I couldn't. I, they invited me and they tried to persuade me, but I just... Yeah. 
couldn't get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bye, everyone. Okay, bye, bye, Francis. Take care. Bye. bye. Uh, bye. Any other bye. comments? Anything? Uh, uh, Any else wants to just say and share? Um, you know, the last five minutes or so. Um, it's it is noon, but we're good. You know, we'll go for an extra five minutes. Um, uh, me maybe. Okay, Reggie. Yeah, it's uh, I I've been practicing trying to find an exercise about self observation. Uh, it is very di difficult to do it, really. Um, I am doing uh, the easiest uh, easiest way that I can. You know, focus my attention just on on my face or my hand. It's very difficult, but it's it's amazing, really. Yeah. It's very good. Uh, I noticed that, you know, uh, emotions disappear. I'm more connected to my environment. I feel the air. The, I smell the, the air, the soil. So it's good, but difficult. And yeah. what I try to do is to go very, very easy. Uh, yeah. uh, try to notice my breathing. Mm, and uh, that's it. I mean, it's complicated, but uh, an amazing tool, really. Uh, yeah. I try to have the the right attitude, like uh, not not to be judging or thinking about that or, or saying it's good, it's bad. Mm, and I am in that step now. Yeah, just baby steps. You know, uh, I, I keep on forgetting sometimes that I've been doing this for 37 years. And, you know, I can be here talking to you and aware of my whole body. But I wasn't always able to do this. Um, as I mentioned before, I was I only about seven years ago. So after doing this for 30 years, am I able to talk and maintain a degree of awareness? And to be honest, a lot of the time when I was talking today, I wasn't fully aware of my body because I was more concerned with what I was saying. And uh, I got lost in my words. But Reggie, I have a challenge for you. Mm -hmm. um, school is still on, right? Sorry? You're still, school is still going, right? Okay, Where you yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, try to be aware of your facial features. Try to become, just be aware of the emotion in your face when you're standing in front of the classroom. He's a high school science physics teacher. Mm -hmm. When you're with your okay. class. Just try to become aware of some of the expressions that you make, some of the emotions that okay. you reveal through your face to your students. Just, uh, you know, try and take a little, you know, these little snapshots of these okay. moments uh, when you are teaching. See if you can do that. Uh, okay. I also, I did what, I, what you told me. I mean, I have uh, an alarm on my uh, phone. So every half hour, it, it sounds, it rings. So it's like an exercise. I try to yeah. be aware at least for, a, you know, a second or two. Just for, yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ex excellent. Yeah. yeah. There's also a mindfulness spell you can have as an open tab on your computer. And you can set it to be short or loud. Uh, um, you can set it for random times or specific times. I'll, I'll post a link for that as well. Um, I find that I have to turn that off because I get too habituated to it. So I turned it off and I turned it back on and I turn it off and I turn it on. And, uh, but it's a good tool and you can get these mindfulness spells as apps for your smartphone and they'll just uh, kind of uh, um, ring a bell that uh, brings you back. Um, brings you back to the moment and uh, um, anything else anyone want to add before we finish? Since uh, the three uh, meetings uh, on Sunday, yes. I, like, I feel like I'm back in business again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Man. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you. Know, you. Let's, let's send a prayer to Iman and hope everything is okay. Um, she said everything was in the Facebook group. She oh, said, good. I thought we were okay. Oh, good. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't look. That's good. I mean, to. You know, I assume that I, I, I could have uh, just imagined it, but it certainly sounded like a rocket going overhead. Yeah, I did. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the awareness of our death. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff, at the very end of uh, Bales Above Tales, said if he could do anything, he would implant an organ within us that made us aware of our death. Um, and to be in a zone like that, you are 
much more aware of your death and, you know, the destructive nature of humans and how crazy people are. Um, at any rate, thank you all for joining me. And um, I don't know where everyone, you know, there's a few other people who are part of the group. And, you know, my meetings that I'm going to have with everyone, I want to, you know, a week and a half to two weeks. You know, initially I said a week, but, um, you know, there were, there could be nine people. Um, one of them may never show up. She's kind of shy. Um, mm -hmm. That would be nine hours a week for me, which is just getting a little too much. But I will try and be personally in contact with everyone, um, you know, at least an hour long talking, um, probing deeply um, every two weeks. Um, maybe, you know, a week and a half to two weeks. We'll see. Um, okay, everyone take care. Thank you for joining me. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Alan. Bye. 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 Have a nice week. You too. Take care.